Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of The History Behind, a series in which I'll be taking you through the fascinating history behind everyday objects and practices everyone encounters in their daily lives. Today I'll be digging up the story behind an object that nearly everyone in the Western world is compelled to use almost every day. That would be toilet paper. But paper, let alone modern toilet paper, wasn't used as butt fodder for most of human history. For the most part, people just used whatever was around them, but the ancient Romans had a particularly inventive solution to the problem of wiping. They used something called the xylospongium, also known as the tersorium in their communal latrines. It was a natural sponge from the Mediterranean affixed to the end of a stick, and after being dumped in a bucket of vinegar or salt water after wiping, they were left for the next guy to come along. I mean, if you were lucky, you would be rinsed in running water like the sewer systems beneath the latrine. Uh, now, rich Romans used wool. There is one example of a xylospongium being used for something else, however. The famous Stoic philosopher and tutor of Nero, Seneca, relates in his Epistulae Morales uh, how a German gladiator killed himself in an amphitheater's latrine by stuffing a xylospongium down his throat. Well, I mean, at least the Romans had a better than the Greeks, they wiped themselves with these abrasive little ceramic discs called pesoi, and uh, I reckon it hurt a lot. Paper has been used as bum fodder since the 6th century in China, but as we'll find out later, uh, toilet paper in its modern form is a shockingly recent innovation, but back to the 6th century. The earliest known reference to paper specifically being used to wipe was written down around 589 AD, when a Chinese government official and polymath named Yan Zitui, or uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, wrote uh, that paper on which there are quotations or commentaries from the five classics or the names of sages I dare not use for toilet purposes. In his 26th chapter book, Yan Shi Jiak Sun. Okay, I'm sorry for the mispronunciation. The title translates to The Family Instructions of Master Yan and documents his personal philosophy with the intent of providing advice to his sons. I mean, it's pretty solid advice, but if I ever find myself on the toilet without anything other than a scrap of paper with a random philosopher's name on it, what choice do I really have, right? Now, a further reference to the utilization of paper for toilet purposes in China comes from the Arab writer Abu Zaid Hassan al-Saraf. Writing about China sometime in the early 10th century, he wrote that they, as in the Chinese, do not wash themselves with water when they have done their necessities, but they only wipe themselves with paper. How barbaric. And in the early 14th century, 10 million packages of toilet paper containing up to 10 sheets were produced in a single Chinese province each year. Now, during the reign of the founder of the Ming Dynasty, the Hongwu Emperor, 15,000 sheets of especially soft, perfumed toilet paper were consumed by the imperial family alone. In 1393, during the reign of his successor, the Jianwen Emperor, a staggering 720,000 2 by 3 feet sheets were produced for the imperial court alone. Paper reached Europe in the 11th century, but it didn't prove that popular at first, I'm talking about for writing. However, Johann Gutenberg's printing press made it much more popular, and as such, there was, of course, more opportunity for paper to wind up against a person's nether regions. Exactly that happened. English author and Bishop John Bale referenced how after the dissolution of the English monasteries was carried out by Henry VIII, people began using priceless manuscripts from them as toilet fodder. But of course, the rise of printing led to much cheaper books and newspapers being used instead. An especially striking reference to this resourcefulness comes from the letters the major Georgian politician Philip Stanhope, Earl of Chesterfield, sent to his illegitimate but beloved son as life advice. In this particular letter from 1747, in which he advises his son not to waste his time, Chesterfield tells him about a man who, uh, quote-unquote, bought a common edition of Horace, of which he tore off gradually a couple of pages, carried them with him to that necessary place, 
read them first, and then sent them down as a sacrifice to Cloacina, the Roman goddess of sewers. Thus was so much time fairly gained. The paper was a rare commodity in most parts of the world until the 17th to 18th centuries, and even when it had become commonplace, people still tended to use either the sort of paper that you can read, or other apparatuses. In a America! up until the 1850s and beyond, the Farmer's Almanac, the Sears Catalog, provided both a good read and a good wipe in the nation's outhouses. In addition, people also still used corn cobs and leaves to wipe themselves. That was until one Joseph C. Gaetti introduced the world to commercially available toilet paper in December of 1857. The details of Gaetti's life are very murky. In fact, the exact years in which he was born and died are unclear. But he was born somewhere between 1817 and 1827, either in Pennsylvania or Massachusetts, and he lived until some point in the 1890s. After moving to New York City and working at a pub for a bit, Gaetti began marketing what would become toilet paper as medicated paper for the water closet. It doesn't really roll off the tongue as well, eh? He was based out of 41 Ann Street and sold a thousand sheets, which were around double the size of average modern sheets, for only a single dollar, which was around $30 in his day. His paper was composed of manila hemp, and it also contained aloe as a lubricant. One advertisement of his, clearly targeted against the reading material then used for wiping, warns consumers of the numerous chemicals found in the paper of his day, which he deems poisons, and compares wiping your ass with them to putting ink in your mouth. But you couldn't just mention wiping your ass in those days, it was unspeakable. So he... So the euphemism he uses for butt in this same ad is the tenderest part of the body corporate, if we accept the eye. Gaddy also watermarked each sheet of his toilet paper with his name and NY. One ad explicitly states that he watermarked his paper in order to distinguish it from imitations, and additionally reveals he autographed each label. This same ad, which was placed in the New York Daily Tribune of Thursday, February 3rd, 1859, went so far as to claim that the president, then James Buchanan, and the cabinet used his paper. Gietti gets a bit ahead of himself and calls it the greatest discovery of modern times so far as alleviating and preventing human suffering. Well, I mean, I guess he might have been right on that one. Even more remarkably, he also claims that as of 1859, which you have to keep in mind is only two years after toilet paper was first put on the market, his medicated paper was for sale by all druggists, and that it was already extensively used for families, schools, hotels, banks, counting houses, and ware rooms. So, let's just say Gaddy liked to bend the truth a bit. But regardless, his youngest son, Henry K. Gaetti, took over his toilet paper business after Gaetti had passed and held the licensing of it until 1891, when some other toilet paper dealers by the name of B.T. Hoogland and Sons sued him for trademark infringement. Somehow, they thought they were entitled to use Joseph Gaetti's name because he had owed them $25 or something. I don't know, it's a bizarre situation. And unbelievably, they actually got the rights to use it. As such, they marketed toilet paper using Gaetti's name until the 1920s. But don't thank Joseph C. Gaetti alone for modern toilet paper, no siree. It was an Albany resident by the name of Seth Wheeler who created the toilet paper roll in 1871, and his company, Albany Perfor Perforated Wrapping Company, was the first to sell toilet paper in rolls. He also created that cardboard tube you find within toilet rolls and dispensers for his rolls. Furthermore, he came up with the idea of adding perforations to the paper two decades later in 1891, thus creating the toilet paper square. As you can guess, he was a pretty prolific inventor and was awarded with over a hundred patents throughout his life, which lasted from 1846 to 1925. So far, two of these toilet paper innovators operated in New York State, but the next two were born there, but operated in Pennsylvania. <laughs> The 
These would be the illustrious Scott brothers. Edward Irvin and Clarence Wood Scott, also hailing from upstate New York, established the Scott Paper Company based in Philadelphia in 1879. Their business strategy was buying paper in bulk, packaging it, and then selling their medicinal toilet paper to hotels and drugstores in order to avoid toilet paper's public unspeakability. They eventually packaged toilet paper for over 2,000 different brands. Now, as a result, toilet paper morphed into an amenity offered by fancy hotels, and people began wanting it for themselves when they saw it in these fancy hotels. Now, something called Waldorf Tissue was their most popular third-party seller, so the Scott brothers bought the trademark to it in 1902 and began selling it themselves under their own name. Now, the Scott Paper Company became the biggest manufacturer of toilet paper in the world and maintained its independence all the way until 1995 when it was acquired by the Kimberly Clark Corporation. In the year prior, it sold 3.6 billion worth of products, billion with a B, and you might recognize one of its brand names, Connell. But let's return back to the, to the 1880s. Production of toilet paper then spread to England. In that decade, and one manufacturer, W.W. Cawley and Co. of Hatton Garden, equipped all the bathrooms of the 1889 World's Fair at Paris with their terrabine perforated paper, their toilet paper. This World Fair happened to be the one that produced the Eiffel Tower, whose bathrooms also hosted their toilet paper. A plethora of other British brands popped up, some of which tried associating themselves with British patriotism by calling themselves things like Victoria and British Number One Thin. Uh, I imagine Queen Victoria wouldn't be that amused by people wiping their ass with something named after her, but I guess it is meant to be a compliment after all. By the Edwardian era, companies in other nations, including Germany, France, and even Japan, began churning out toilet paper. But what really got toilet paper its popularity was the adoption of the flush toilet, which will get blocked up by heavier papers because it, because it has a weird S-shaped trap meant to block sewer gases from spilling out, which forced people to, in turn, adopt toilet paper. It was indoor plumbing that led to toilet paper's ubiquitous use in the modern world, and toilet paper companies like the ones just mentioned began claiming that their paper was recommended by both doctors and plumbers. Charmin, formerly the Hoburg Paper Company, began pantering to homemakers when it was established in 1928 by associating their paper with femininity and softness through putting a dainty female silhouette on their logo, which helped lessen the unmentionability of their product. However, even as late as, eight, as 1930, one German toilet paper producing company called Hackle was using the tagline, ask for a roll of Hackle and you won't have to say toilet paper. I wish Another testament to the fact that modern toilet paper was a very recent development is that in 1935, the Quilted Northern Company was still able to boast that its paper was, get this, splinter free. Pretty astonishing, I know, right? Two-ply was conceived by the British company Andrex in 1942, but the two-ply paper familiar to us today came in the early 60s, and that same decade saw the disappearance of toilet roll wrapper paper in exchange for the multi-pack shrink wrap packaging you have to make a pilgrimage to every time you run out of individual rolls in your bathroom. Back to Charmin. They apparently replaced that woman with a baby, and from the 60s to 80s, their television commercials featured one Mr. Whipple. Mr. Whipple was a fictional grocer whose catchphrase was, Please don't squeeze the Charmin, which of course emphasizes Charmin's softness. He appeared in over 500 different advertisements throughout his decade-spanning career, and one TV Guide poll from 1978 found he was the third best-known man in America, only behind former President Nixon and Billy Graham, which really demonstrates how far toilet paper had come by that point. But he was eventually replaced by the Charmin Bears, and the half-century-old baby was kicked off the packaging by 2004. But toilet paper wasn't advertised as toilet paper on network television due to the stigma around it up until the 70s, because by that decade, p paper had become indispensable to the average American. When Johnny Carson, host of The Tonight Show, joked about there being a toilet paper shortage, people immediately bought as much as they could and created an actual shortage of it. Does that maybe remind you of any recent events? 
And now we've reached today. But what does tomorrow have in stock for humble toilet paper? Does it, eat, does it eat up too many trees? Will we adopt those fancy bidets like the Japanese? Will we even revert back to the xylospongium or corn cobs? Or will we stock our lavatories with toilet paper for millennia to come? But first, I must excuse myself to the washroom. <laughs> 